As Oxfam, we work in more than 90 countries around the world, and one of the biggest problems that we are seeing in terms of being able to uh, run successful development programmes is the problem of armed violence and conflict. Communities that are living in a situation of high armed violence, instability or conflict are basically unable to overcome poverty barriers and it's very, very difficult for development to be successful. And that's why, as a humanitarian development agency, we've got involved in the area of arms control, particularly around the arms trade treaty, but also other areas such as um, cluster munitions and landmines. And the reason um, that we've worked on the arms trade treaty for so long is that we've seen a real correlation between the flood of arms into some of the world's worst conflict hotspots and an increase in poverty and uh, cycles of, of violence and underdevelopment. We've just had a big success as part of the Control Arms Coalition in seeing um, the world's first arms trade treaty being adopted at the United Nations at the, the start of April and opening for signature at the beginning of, of June at the, at the UN. Um, we've been working on this campaign for over a decade. The Control Arms Coalition was launched in 2003 with an aim of um, calling on the world to bring the arms trade under control by creating a treaty that would make governments responsible for all arms transfers, whether they're coming in or out or passing through their territory. And the reason for that is that we have, at best, a very patchwork system of arms controls around the world. And while there are treaties that regulate biological and chemical and nuclear weapons, there's nothing on conventional arms which lead to the <clears throat> death, injury, displacement and suffering of millions of people every day. So the purpose of the Arms Trade Treaty is to, first and foremost, make governments take responsibility for every arms transfer that's coming in or out of their territory. <clears throat> so they must make an assessment as to whether to authorise that arms transfer, and that must, must be based around looking at um, human rights law and humanitarian law rather than profit as the primary um, way to make that decision. And a decision is a risk assessment where they're looking at the arms transfer and first of all if there's any if there's knowledge that they've got that arms are likely to be used to commit um, war crimes for example then there's an absolute prohibition on that arms transfer going ahead and this is all conventional arms so it's everything from battleships and tanks through to small arms guns um, ammunition and also parts and components that might be um, repairing or, or um, being assembled into a whole weapons system um, in a different location so they take that risk uh, assessment and then if it's not doesn't fall under the absolute prohibitions category they then move on to say is there a, a, a major risk that the arms are going to be used uh, for human rights violations or violations of humanitarian law could they be diverted along the transfer um, path they also have to consider issues such as gender-based violence um, violence against children and the risk of corruption in the arms deal and where there are a, a major risk of these situations taking place then the treaty is clear that the government shall not authorise that transfer. So it's a new treaty, it's just, it's just started and it's really important now for all the governments that supported it, over 150 of them, to um, sign and implement this treaty to the highest standard as soon as, as possible. It has the potential to really transform the arms trade and to transform the way that we look at weapons and the, and the arms trade in relation to poverty, in relation to humanitarian situations and in relation to human rights. But we need governments and civil society behind governments holding the them to account to make it work. I think one of the uh, vital contributions that smaller organisations like Action on Armed Violence um, can make is being part of bigger coalitions. And it's really important that in coalitions you have lots of different uh, perspectives and interest areas represented. So, for example, in the work on the Arms Trade Treaty, Action on Armed Violence was really important because they brought in the perspective very directly of survivors. And that was a, a really important element of the campaign. It was important both in terms of thinking through what specifically needed to be in the treaty that would ensure that it was going to be something that um, helped to prevent future um, uh, victims or, or survivors of armed violence. But it was also important because AOAV helped bring the voices and experience of survivors directly to the negotiations and to the diplomats who were making the decisions. And um, we did that by bringing um, survivors from partner organisations that AOAV was working with directly to the UN, who were very much um, uh, then working 
working as part of the Control Arms Coalition team at the UN and being able to talk directly to delegates about their own personal experience of how armed violence had affected them, how it had then had a knock-on effect on the community and why this needed to change. And that's really powerful because often decision makers, negotiators, you're, they're stuck away at the, at the UN. It's quite often quite removed from the daily realities of people's lives. And to be able to bring that very personal and direct experience was extremely powerful and I think a really important part of the success we had.